The next item of business is a statement by Jenny Gilruth on Rail Accident Investigation Branch Report into Carmont Passenger Train Derailment. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Jenny Gilruth, Minister. Presiding Officer. On Wednesday, the 12th of August 2020, the 0638am high speed train 1T08 from Aberdeen to Glasgow derailed as it struck debris on the track close to Carmont in Aberdeenshire. Today, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch has published its final report into the events leading up to and during this tragic and shocking crash. Before I outline the report findings to Parliament, I would ask Parliament to remember the three people who tragically lost their lives that day. The train driver, Brett McCulloch, the conductor, Donald Dinning, and a passenger, Christopher Stutchbury. Brett McCulloch was only 45 and had moved from Kent to make his life in Aberdeenshire. He had been tra a train driver for six years and he was very popular at the Aberdeen depot. Donald Dinney was 58. His RMT branch in Aberdeen paid tribute to him as someone who lit up the room with funny stories and wit. Christopher Stutchbury was 62. He came from Aberdeen and was an integral member of the TARS towing team as well as a volunteer at a specialist palliative unit. All three were beloved family men who are sadly missed by their friends, relatives and colleagues. On behalf of everyone in the Scottish Government, and I am sure in this chamber, I want to share my profound condolences to those men's families and friends for their loss. I have offered to meet with all of the families at any time now or in the future, whilst appreciating that nothing I can say as Minister can possibly erase their grief. The derailment that day also resulted in injuries, some of them serious, to six passengers and staff. And I want to convey my sympathies to everyone affected and hurt. That includes the wider local community and the railway family. All three men came from the local area. Indeed, Brett McCulloch lived just 15 minutes away. The shock of the impact of this accident was widely and keenly felt, and I know it continues to be so. The publication of today's report is yet another painful reminder of the heartrending events of that dreadful day. But I hope it will also help to provide at least some explanation for what exactly happened. On the morning of the 12th of August 2020, there were thunderstorms with associated extreme heavy rain in southern Aberdeenshire. Weather records indicated at the time between 0500 hours and 0900 hours, around 52 millimetres of rain fell in the Carmont area, which is about 90% of the average total rainfall for the whole of August at that location. The 0638 hours high speed train from Aberdeen to Glasgow had been stopped just south of Carmont due to a line blockage near Lawrence Kirk. The train was in the process of returning to Stonehaven when it derailed. The Rail Accident Investigation Branch, or the RAIB, is the independent body appointed by the UK Government to investigate railway accidents. And I want to thank the staff of the RAIB who undertook this work for their careful and thorough approach to this investigation and the clarity of their findings and recommendations. The report's main finding is that the train derailed because it struck debris that had been washed onto the track from a drainage trench during recent extreme rainfall. The report states that the drainage system and associated earthworks, which had been installed between 2011 and 2012, had not been constructed in accordance with the original design. This meant that the drainage system was not able to safely accommodate the water flows that morning. The investigation concluded that had the drainage system been installed in accordance with the design, it would have been capable of safely accommodating the flow of surface water. However, as installed, the drainage system was unable to do so. It is clear that the drainage system and associated earthworks and how they were constructed were the cause of the accident, the train derailment being the tragic consequence. Presiding officer, one of the RAIB's most important findings is that there was nothing in the way that Brett McCulloch was driving the train which caused the accident. He was driving within the rules and the instruction which was given to him. The refurbished high-speed train that derailed at Carmen was fully compliant with legal requirements to operate. However, since it was designed and constructed, railway standards have continued to change and to improve, reflecting lessons learned from just this sort of investigation. The report states that a train built to the most recent crashworthiness standards would have had a number of design features that are intended to improve the safety of passengers. And whilst we cannot be certain about what could have happened in the hypothetical situation of different rolling stock in the same accident, 
the report does state that the body shells of the coaches generally performed well in the accident. However, the REIB considers it more likely than not that the outcome would have been better if the train had been compliant with modern crashworthiness standards. In respect of the driving cab, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch reports that the speed of impact was significantly beyond the collision speeds for which even modern cabs are designed to provide protection for occupants. Now, some of the REIB's key findings relate to the approach taken by the operations team. The investigation found evidence that the Scotland Route Control Team, which is operated by Network Rail employees, was under severe workload pressure that morning due to the volume of concurrent weather-related events in Scotland. Despite the severe nature of disruption to Scotland's railway infrastructure that morning, no additional resource had been obtained for the control room. A senior management goal command structure to give oversight and direction had not been established to relieve the pressure on the controllers. Controllers had not been given information, procedures or training that would have enabled them to effectively manage a complex weather event like that experienced on the 12th of August 2020. No instruction was given by route control or the signaller that train 11008 should be run at a lower speed on its journey between Carmont and Stonehaven. Presiding officer, rail is still a complex mix of devolved and reserved competencies. The Scottish Government is responsible for specifying and funding the operation of ScotRail and the Caledonian sleeper trains and for specifying the funding and outputs from Network Rail in Scotland. But rail safety is overseen by the statutory railway safety regulator, the Office of Rail and Road. It will now discharge its statutory duty of ensuring that those responsible for implementing the RAIB's recommendations take appropriate responsive action. And whilst the Scottish Government funds Network Rail in Scotland, its accountability continues to rest with the UK Government. I have therefore written today to the UK Government Secretary of State for Transport, Grant Shapps, seeking an urgent meeting to discuss the report's findings in detail on what that means for both governments. I know that Network Rail and ScotRail will wish to engage constructively on the report's findings. There must also be a role for ministers in ensuring that never again will we see a repeat of that dreadful day at Carmont. Presiding officer, three people dying as a result of the Carmont derailment was three people too many. And while rail remains the safest form of transport, we must seek to learn the lessons from this incident to further improve the safety of all who work and travel on the railways in Scotland. And to ensure that we do take appropriate steps and quickly, I am announcing today that Transport Scotland will convene a steering group to take forward implementation of the recommendations about safety performance of in accidents of older rolling stock, including HST rolling stock on ScotRail. And because of their crucial role in both driving and maintaining these trains, I can give an undertaking to Scotland's rail unions and employees that we will involve them in this important activity alongside rail industry representatives and the safety bodies. The REIB report establishes the factual circumstances of the accident, but it does not apportion blame. The Office of Rail and Road is undertaking a parallel joint investigation along with Police Scotland and the British Transport Police which will be reported to the Procurator Fiscal later this year. And that will give prosecutors time to consider questions of criminal prosecutions and a fatal accident inquiry. These are, of course, matters for the Lord Advocate acting independently. However, I want to conclude by giving this undertaking. We will continue to work with industry partners, the trade unions and the UK Government to deliver improvements to make our railways safer and more resilient to the challenges of adverse weather events. And finally, presiding officer, I give a solemn assurance that the Scottish Government will do everything in our power to urge everyone responsible for safety on our transport networks to make them more resilient and safer for all passengers and employees. We cannot and we must not allow a repeat of the terrible Carmont tragedy. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement? Uh, and can I welcome the announcement of a steering group? Um, and I hope she'll keep us informed about its work. The report into the Carmont Rail tragedy makes for sobering reading. We should remember that while this is about failures of systems and lessons that can be learned, it's fundamentally about the loss of three lives. 
the conductor Donald Dinney, train driver Brett McCulloch and passenger Christopher Stutchbury. But there were six other people on the train on August the 12th, 2020, and they were injured when it hit debris, mainly gravel, and derailed. Now, the source of the debris was a drain that had been put in by Carillion, but not in accordance with the design. And had they stuck to the original design, the tragedy may not have happened. So can the Minister confirm whether Network Rail Scotland have checked all other Carillion constructed drainage systems to ensure there were no um, potential issues elsewhere on the network. The RAIB also said that despite knowing about the threat, Network Rail had not sufficiently recognised that its existing measures did not fully address the risk from extreme rainfall events. So areas of significant weakness had not been addressed. What has the Minister done about this? And finally, the driver did not have a seat belt. This does seem extraordinary. It seems to me that this should be standard. Does the Minister agree? Minister. I thank Graham Simpson for uh, his question. Uh, he covers a number of different areas. First of all, to, to reflect on the, the steering group, of course, I will keep members informed of that. And I've written uh, to opposition spokespeople this afternoon. Additionally, um, on the back of the uh, ahead of the statement, rather. In terms of the injured people who were involved in the crash, and he alludes to the, the drain being the cause uh, of the crash itself, um, I have confirmed with Network Rail that they have checked all drains that were uh, installed or any uh, maintenance work that was carried out by Carillion that was done at the time of the crash itself. But even before the accident at Carmen, its project teams had apparently started to review historical projects, um, those that are up to 10 years old, and if you think about the age of this dream, it would have been at the time over 10 years old, to ascertain whether a health and safety file, if required, had been accepted by the National Records Group and stored appropriately. So Network Rail have undertaken that work, and I received another assurance from Alex Hines regarding that matter uh, just earlier this morning. On the second point, Mr Simpson raises around about um, the weaknesses in the existing uh, fleet. I think he mentioned some of the challenges here around about Network Rail's responsibilities. Um, I can't instruct Network Rail because they are accountable to the UK Government. However, um, Scotland's Railway has established a permanently staffed weather desk position. This came into operation shortly after um, the event itself. And Network Rail has informed the RAIB that suitably qualified people will have been recruited to cover that position. And I'm told that it's a better example of uh, both organisations, Scott Rail and Network Rail, working together. In light of the, the likelihood that climate change, as we know, is going to exacerbate some of these risks further, Network Rail have decided to commission two task forces to advise on the ways in which it could improve its understanding of earthworks. One was chaired by Lord Robert Mayer um, and the other by Dame Julia Slingo, and, um, and it also considered how it can improve the management of its earthwork portfolio to better understand the risk of rainfall. And I raised this issue with Alex Hines again earlier today and was given an assurance that Network Rail are now using technology to even look, for example, at hillsides across the country to try and ascertain and to predict when events like this might happen in the future. Additionally, Network Rail, I am told, are walking the lines of uh, Scotland's railways to try and you know, ascertain in the future where some of these um, risks might appear. Um, I also gave an undertaking, though, in terms of action I have taken to establish a, a steering group. I recognise there are cross devolved and reserved competencies here, but I'm interested in getting a resolution to ensure this never happens again. Um, and you know, I look forward to working constructively with the UK Government on this, uh, recognising uh, the horrific nature of what we are discussing today. Um, finally, Mr Simpson raised a point around about seatbelts. Um, I am told that research undertaken by the, the Rail Safety and Standards Board optimising driving cab design for delivering protection in a collision um, into driver protection in a collision found that whilst there are no technical or operational problems foreseen that present to um, prevent the fitment of driver protection, um, there, it, there may be a, a challenge regarding ensuring maintenance and driver acceptance of a viability assessment. So at this moment in time, it's not a requirement. I'm not ruling it out in the future, but there are no requirements, I think, at this moment in time for any modern trains for drivers to have seat belts fitted. But the RAIB have recommended that the RSS be review its previous research on fitting secondary impact protection devices for train drivers in light of the circumstances at Carmont. Um, so I'll give him an undertaking that we will take the necessary steps um, from the 1st of April, of course, if the uh, recommendations from that research conclude that seatbelts uh, would be an appropriate response. But uh, again, I think that probably requires wider discussion with the trade unions and employees too. Bibby. 
Thank you, President Officer. All our thoughts are with the loved ones of those who died in this tragedy. This is a sobering report for Carillion, Network Rail and the entire rail industry. Investigators found that warnings were ignored and that systemic failures caused this derailment. There is a word for that, negligence. The drainage system did not work. Carillion did not construct it to designer standards. Network rail processes were not followed. ScotRail staff were insufficiently trained. There were no suitable arrangements to restrict the speed of the train, despite the conditions. In light of this, can I ask the Minister directly, does she still have confidence in the Managing Director of Scotland's Railways and the leadership of the ScotRail Alliance? Because, as left, the train drivers' union do not. As left are also calling for ageing high-speed trains to be phased out by August next year. Can the Minister tell us when these trains will be withdrawn from service? It is for the Lord Advocate to consider prosecutions and a fatal accident inquiry. But it is for ministers here and at a UK level to decide whether there should be a full public inquiry. Does the minister believe there is a case for a full public inquiry to ensure lessons are fully learned and this can never happen again? Minister. I thank Mr Bibby for his question. So three points that he, he raises. He used a word which I'm not going to repeat because um, he, will be, uh, he will understand that there are uh, legal um, proceedings that may follow from uh, the next report which is yet to publish. So I wouldn't want to comment on the outcome of that. But on the first question he raises regarding a uh, position of senior officials, uh, I think at this moment in time, um, I know why Asla feels very strongly about this. And in fact, I, I met with Kevin Lindsay only yesterday and, and we discussed some of um, the content of uh, the issues that Mr Bibby has raised here. I, um, I don't think at this moment in time it is the time to be calling for resignations. However, um, I recognise and I understand why Asla feel very strongly about this. As I mentioned, the Office on Rail and Roads parallel joint investigation with Police Scotland and the British Transport Police is going to report to the Procurator Fiscal. And that will allow prosecutors to consider those questions of criminal prosecutions and also whether or not there will be a fatal accident inquiry. So those are, of course, as I mentioned in my statement, matters for the Lord Advocate. Now, Mr Bibby asked me to commit to a public inquiry. I don't want to prejudge the outcome of that inquiry or that investigation first. A public inquiry may well flow from that, but it's not for me as Minister to prejudge the outcome at this stage. Um, and, or nor would it be for me to preempt the outcome of that, that process. Um, Mr Bibby asked a question regarding uh, the HSTs, and I'm aware, additionally, presiding officer, this was also raised at First Minister's questions. Um, I think it's important to remember that the trains in question were safe to be running. Uh, they are older trains, undoubtedly. They met the standard and the requirement at the time when they were built. Um, we now need to look at that stock and we need to ensure um, that a disaster like this never happens again. The first way we do that is by working with the trade union. So again, I spoke to Mr Lindsay about this yesterday. We will come to, I think, looking at a date in the future which we may be able to remove some of the, these trains from service. But I need to convene that steering group and I need to look forward to what that would mean for the, the current fleet of trains and what that would mean for the viability of rail travel in Scotland just now, recognising that we are, uh, to some extent, quite reliant on the current HSTs which are in operation at this moment in time. But I give them an undertaking that that steering group will absolutely look at this issue, working with the trade unions, working hopefully too with the UK Government and with Network Rail and with ScotRail to ensure that we deliver on the safety improvements that are needed. And, um, that our rolling stock is up to, to, to scratch and that it also provides the protection and a level of security for, for staff, but also for passengers. Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I begin by extending my condolences to the families of Brett McCulloch, Donald Denny and Christopher Stutchbury. Some of the findings in this investigation report are challenging to take on board and some of the things that the RAIB found seem so straightforward and obvious it's hard to believe that they were not in place. The Minister mentioned some of the changes brought in since 2020. Can she provide more detail on those and how they might be helping to make Scotland's railways safer now? Minister. Um, I, I can understand why members um, think that the report is very challenging to read uh, in terms of some of the, the findings. I certainly found it very challenging a fortnight ago to sit through a presentation from the RAIB on the, the draft findings from the report. Um, I do want to try to provide some level of reassurance. I know that since the accident took place, Network Rail has put into effect a range of changes. It installed, for example, a new drainage system at Carmont to seek to prevent another washout in the same location. And they've also installed guardrails to help derailed, uh, keep derailed trains in, in line on the approach to the bridge itself. 
It has improved its rules and its standards relating to the control of train movements during extreme weather events, and it has also introduced a new process on how it manages its response to safety recommendations and a, a programme of audits to check the correct implementations of risk controls. But I want to work further with Network Rail on some of these changes and, and what they mean for uh, rail safety in Scotland, recognising, of course, that rail safety is ultimately uh, a reserve matter to the UK Government. Liam Kerr to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to echo the condolences and sentiments of colleagues from across the Chamber. The Carmen tragedy and its needless loss of life must never happen again. The report identifies that the age of the train and its design features contributed to the severity of the crash. Now, Neil Bibby asked a very good question, and respectfully, I am not sure we heard an answer. So, can the Minister tell me, is there a break clause in the contract between the Roscoe and ScotRail for the HSTs? And regardless, when does the newly nationalised ScotRail intend to replace all Class 43 sets on its network with new trains to modern standards. Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Kerr for his supplementary question and I note uh, again uh, his, his condolences to the families affected. Uh, on the specific question he asked regarding a, a break clause, I am not cited on that. I can certainly find that information for him. Um, with regard to the high speed trains them, them first, themselves, though, I think it is important again to reflect that although these trains were older, the refurbished high speed train that derailed at Carmen was fully compliant with legal requirements to operate. But since, of course, it was designed and constructed, railway standards have, have moved on. Um, in terms of the train operator, which is in this case ScotRail, they have the statutory duty to ensure that the trains they operate are safe. And it is the statutory duty of the Office of Rail and Road as a regulator to oversee that duty with enforcement if necessary. Now, I know that the Office of Rail and Road are going to monitor the work being undertaken to address the recommendations of the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. And the duty, that duty, of course, is going to pass to the new publicly owned and controlled ScotRail on the 1st of April, as Mr Kerr alludes to. And we have been absolutely clear in the Scottish Government, I will work with the industry, with unions, with employees and real safety bodies to take forward the implementation of all recommendations that are relevant to our obligations and responsibilities. I am sorry I cannot give Mr Kerr a date right now, but I have committed to convene a steering group and we absolutely need to see action on this issue. I agree with uh, him on that wholeheartedly. Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Mercedes Vialba. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also add my condolences and thoughts to everyone affected? Um, clearly, many of the recommendations relate to matters for reserve bodies and related to reserve powers on rail safety. Does the Minister know how the UK Government has responded to the RAIB's report and what role and power does she have to ensure that Network Rail implement all the findings and recommendations that arise from it urgently? Minister. Um, I think it is really for the UK Government to explain how, how it will respond. But as far as I am aware, I do not think the UK Government has yet made public, uh, a public statement. I may be wrong on that. As I did set out, the responsibilities, of course, in, involving reserved and devolved areas are complex. But I am keen to ensure that we do take a collaborative approach to deliver the changes the RAIB is, is recommending. I am keen to engage with transport, uh, the Transport Secretary to agree how we do this, which is why I wrote to Grant Chaps this morning. Um, to encourage him to work with me on taking forward those recommendations. And Network Rail's response to the RAIB report shows it too is taking its responsibilities here seriously, I think. But Network Rail are not accountable to me, so it's really important we have that cross-government working, I think, on this matter. The recommendations, of course, will now be reviewed urgently by the ORR to determine how best they will be progressed. And the ORR, as I've mentioned, is the statutory authority on rail safety and on all recommendations agreed for implementation, which will be monitored by the OOR, ORR rather, for uh, all operators. But I am keen to work, as I mentioned, collaboratively with the UK Government on this, recognising and understanding the different roles and responsibilities both our governments play here. But it is absolutely essential we guard against something like this happening ever again. And for that to work, we will have to work collaboratively. Mercedes Vialba to be followed by John Mason. Thank you. This tragedy has highlighted the need for a safe and resilient railway. Yet there are plans to cut thousands of safety critical jobs at Network Rail, and the First Minister earlier today failed to give a commitment that there will, not, that there will be no compulsory redundancies when ScotRail enters public ownership. So will the Minister take action to ensure these Network Rail cuts are scrapped and give a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies at ScotRail? Minister. I am happy to, to give Mercedes Villalba an undertaking that I will meet with Network Rail and I would not seek to see any job cuts in Scotland of any nature, but Network Rail are not accountable to me. 
so I'm limited in what I can do in this regard. I would like to raise this matter with the UK Government directly, and of course, any cuts to jobs in Scotland are not acceptable. Now, Mercedes Villalba also raises the issue of no compulsory redundancies. We have not yet ruled that out as a government, she, she will know that. But what I have been doing for the course of the last four weeks is meeting directly as a group with the trade unions and then individually for the last two weeks to better understand their negotiating positions in terms of any future pay settlements. That has not yet been taken off the table because we have not yet arrived at a deal. I am hopeful that we will do in the future, but I do not want to prejudge that. So this is part of a negotiation process with the, the rail unions, but I have to say that the conversations I've had with them, particularly in light of the announcement around about a national, co national conversation on uh, Scotland's Railways' future, um, have been really positive and they've been really keen to work with the government. And I, I welcome that dialogue. I think it's really essential as we move forward that government works with the rail unions to deliver um, a railway for the people of Scotland, which works. John Mason to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. Uh, the Minister has indicated that there will be certain work ca being carried on, investigations by different bodies and individuals going forward. C can she spell out exactly what will happen next and any timescale, if, if it's possible, to, uh, around that? Minister. Uh, Network Rail and operators will review the recommendations and enter into discussions with the ORR on their delivery, um, for example, on timescales. Some of the, the recommendations need a great deal of technical input. So design developments for rolling stock, modification, costing, and therefore some of those um, can, will, and can and will be implemented immediately, whilst others, of course, will need a bit more time. I, I did set out in my statement the next steps in terms of the role of the Office of Rail and Road and that of the Crown Office and the Lord Advocate. But I'm also aware uh, of the call by ASLE for a, a public inquiry, which has been mentioned previously, and at an appropriate time, um, that will, of course, be considered. I'm very keen that we get all members in, and I'd be grateful if we could pick up the pace. Um, and I call Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too would wish to associate myself and the Scottish Liberal Democrats with the comments from the Minister and other colleagues in offering condolences to the family and friends of those who lost their lives and sympathies to those who were injured on 12 August 2020. We welcome the creation of the steering group to look at HST trains and the other recommendations it will cover in its remit that the Minister has announced and we welcome any information on a timetable being available as soon as possible as to its work. In the knowledge that more frequent and extreme storms are likely to occur, will the Scottish Government be working with Network Rail to ensure that extra provision is provided to inspect the network and which will provide reassurance to passengers and staff of safety of trains? Minister. Uh, I thank Ms Bishop for her, her question. Um, first of all, she asked a question regarding the steering group and timescales. I'm not able to give timescales to her right now. I'd like to speak to the trade, union, trade unions, first of all, and to get partners involved, UK Government, um, Network Rail, Scott Rail, round the table, first of all, to, to give her that information. I know Mr Simpson asked for further information on that, and I'd be more than happy to share that with her once the group has been convened and actions agreed. She mentioned uh, some of the challenges around about adverse weather events in the, the future, and as we know, climate change is going to have a continued impact on our, our transport network. Um, and I, you know, I think I touched upon this in, in my statement, but we were talking about a significant amount of rainfall on the morning of the 12th of August 2020. Um, I think the, the rain that fell that day was a, a very unusual circumstance, and the Met Office uh, analysis indicates exceptionally high level of rain falling between 10 to 6 in the morning and 9 o'clock when the, the train itself um, derailed. Um, early action has already been taken by Network Rail to better understand and react to extreme weather events and to improve the, the risk management of earthworks. And I spoke to that in a response to a, a previous member's question. She uh, asked a question regarding greater provision. I would be more than happy to raise that with Network Rail. I do not want to prejudge again the outcome of the steering group. There are a lot of factors that intersect here in terms of climate change, but also adaptation, how we look at our rolling stock, how we future-proof that for greater safety improvements. So I hope that gives her an assurance that this will be uh, looked at by the, the steering group in due course. I would be more than happy to update her with further detail as and when that is agreed. Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Mark Roskill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My thoughts too are with everybody impacted by this tragedy. Rail incidents in Scotland are rare, but we should not underestimate the impact any derailment or incident has on drivers other onboard staff um, and passengers' well-being. Some of the findings of the report, which are really quite harrowing to read, relate to the crashworthiness of the trains and especially the glass in the windows. Can the Minister say what more can be done to make sure the trains that people work and travel in are as safe as they can be? Minister. 
Um, some of the recommendations, as I think I mentioned, need a bit more research to explore how best we are going to implement them. Um, already, research has been undertaken into driver's seatbelts, as I think I mentioned to Graeme Simpson. The ORR is going to consider how best to achieve a good outcome for these, along with input from train operators. There may be some interim uh, argument for uh, arrangements rather for modifications to rules implemented until some recommendations are fully implemented, but this is going to be for uh, the industry uh, to guide or for the ORR to decide upon. Some of the findings, as Eleanor Whitman alluded to, are, are very hard to read. They are harrowing, particularly the findings relating to the windows and the effect of the shattered glass in particular. Um, this is a good example of where there uh, are no easy or obvious solutions, because one conclusion might be to strengthen and change the glass configuration in trains, but we also know that the glass does need to be able to be broken in certain circumstances too. But we cannot shy away from this task, and I am clear that the Scottish Government, which takes responsibility uh, for rolling stock after the 1st of April, will play its full part in determining what changes need to take place and quickly. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Tess White. Thank you. Can I also extend my deepest sympathies to loved ones of those whose lives were cut short um, by this tragedy? Um, the Minister has already mentioned about climate adaptation. I was wondering if she could expand on that a little, particularly in terms of how capital investment uh, will help that adaptation, and also the issue around uh, training and support for rail workers to operate modern forecasting systems to enable us to better track and and understand how these extreme weather events are, are unfolding in real time. Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Ruskell for his question. Um, we fund Network Rail to carry out um, their operations in Scotland, and as part of our, our high-level agreement, um, climate adaptation is built into that. Events, though, at Carmen, as we know, are a really sharp reminder of the need to adapt our transport network to the effects of severe weather. And we know as well that climate change is only going to increase, and the report itself notes that climate change has made heavier rainfall more likely to occur, so a storm of a particular duration and intensity now has a shorter return period. But notwithstanding the progress being made in decarbonising the transport network, adaptation of existing infrastructure needs to happen. Network Rail has implemented changes, as I have spoken to today, in both their infrastructure operations and in terms of weather management to enhance and improve transport resilience during severe weather and continue, of course, to implement changes to make the railway safe for all users. Action has also been taken uh, by Transport Scotland, who have identified the need for climate change mitigation and adaptation as a central plank in the recently published National Transport Strategy, which sets out the vision for the next decades. But I hope Mr Ruskell uh, has uh, an undertaking of how seriously the Scottish Government is taking this matter. I am sure it will be addressed in further detail by the steering group in due course. Tess White to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Stonehaven derailment is a tragedy that must never be repeated. We know the North East has been badly affected by severe weather events in recent months. I know the Minister has touched briefly on this, but what assessment has been made of the rail infrastructure following these events and what measures have been implemented by the Scottish Government to mitigate the effects of flooding and landslides in future, including improved disaster recovery. Minister. Um, I thank Tess White for her, her question. She raised a number of issues regarding some of the changes that have been implemented, primarily as she will recognise some of the changes that have been installed uh, related to network rail responsibility. So I will come on to those in a moment. Um, and I recognise some of the challenges here uh, with regard to the area of Scotland that she represents and the really damaging periods of poor weather we have had in, in recent weeks and months that have impacted on people's lives. So Network Rail have installed a new drainage system that I spoke to with improved capacity and with features intended to stop another washout from happening. Um, that was installed in 2020 to replace the 2011-2012 system prior to the railway reopening after the uh, derailment itself. They have also installed guardrails, uh, both up and down lines, on the approach to Bridge 325 when the track was relayed after the accident. And that protection includes gathering rails and on the downline extends beyond the site on the washout. Now, she asked about Scottish Government actions. Scotland's Railway has established a permanently staffed weather desk position to monitor weather conditions and advising controllers on the necessary precautionary actions. And I think I mentioned that in my response to, to Graham Simpson. That is leading to better team working between Network Rail and, and ScotRail staff additionally. And of course, uh, that will pass to Scottish Government from April 1st. And blanket speed restrictions in areas have been introduced without earthworks on the at-risk list from September of 2020. And as we know, uh, no instruction was given to the driver that day to slow down. So consideration of introducing uh, more regular speed restrictions has been a, a major um, part of the action that Network Rail have taken forward. 
And Julian Martin. Sir, um, the Minister has answered quite a lot of questions around the environmental um, impacts that, that, that we're seeing uh, on, on around the, the rail network, so I won't go into that again and ask her to rehash them. So I want to ask her what sort of action she's asking the network rail uh, to, to ensure so that something like this does not ever occur again in the future. Minister. Um, I'm keen to meet with Network Rail um, soon to discuss this further. I, I mentioned in my response to um, Graeme Simpson that I'd met with Alex Hines uh, earlier today uh, for a very short call to discuss some of the report's findings. I'm keen to, to meet with Network Rail in more detail to establish uh, a better understanding of where they see their priorities going forward from the report. The report itself is 300 pages in, in total. It's a substantial piece of work. The RAIB undertook it over a number of months. So I don't want to jump to conclusions with regard to recommendations for Network Rail at this stage. And of course, Network Rail have no responsibility to report to me in this Parliament. They report to UK Government Ministers. So, recognising some of the challenges here in terms of reserved and devolved competencies, I wouldn't like to sketch out what I see for uh, Network Rail in terms of uh, the actions that they need to take forward. That's for the Office of Rail and Road, of course, to enforce in terms of the recommendations. They are the regulator, and I would expect that they will be working with Network Rail on that. I would also, though, expect that Network Rail would want to be and um, uh, would certainly be very welcome to engage with the steering group. Um, along with ScotRail and uh, along with UK Government representation, because I think it's absolutely vital we have all partners at the table and, of course, the trade unions, ensuring that we get it right and we put in place the recommendations from this report to ensure a disaster uh, like that that happened at Carmen never happens again. Thank you. That concludes the Ministerial Statement, Rail Accident Investigation Branch Report into Carmen Passenger Train Derailment.